Welcome back to segment number three of week two. We're exploring operating systems. The most recent video, video number two, explored the way in which an operating system coordinates the hardware resources of your computer, such as the hard drive, the CPU, and the RAM, as it is used by various applications. This next segment, we're going to explore the fundamental unit of storage and processing inside a computer, which is nothing other than a file. Now you've heard this word before because we interact with files all the time. We download files, we play files, we transfer files onto USB sticks, we send files over the email. I want to expand our concept of the file and I'd like to give you some tools for managing those files in a way that is, um, allows you to see uh, how those files work and troubleshoot issues as they come up. It will also help with your organization in general and if you're working in an organization they probably have an existing set of files that you're going to want to interact with in an intelligent and thoughtful way. So we are exploring the Microsoft Windows operating system because in all likelihood you are running a computer that has Microsoft Windows installed. So our segment is corresponding with exercise number two and that is in the module called uh, operating systems and file trees. So if you are just jumping on with us you can jump down to exercise two that's called everything is a file almost and I will walk through what this instruction guide explains in text. The definition of a file that we can work with is very simple. It's a named chunk of information or data that's stored in the computer. If we imagine the hard drive is our permanent or non-volatile storage system in a computer. So here is our hard disk drive. We have this sense that computers have tons of files in them, but how are these files organized and what makes them unique? We can think of a file, uh, unlike uh, we often use, say, a word processing document. Boy, that is an ugly rectangle. Word processing document, we are used to having a file name. When we save a file, it asks for what file name do you want to save this under. So files all have names to identify them uniquely in the computer. Files also have types that we may not interact with very often. A file type is a description of how the information within that file is organized. For example, a word processing document is saved in a file that has a type of, uh, it has a, a file type that corresponds with how the text in that particular document is laid out. That's uh, including, you know, what are the headers what are the margins on that particular document? That's encoded or it's described in a particular way inside the file. Now when we read that file in, say Microsoft Word, which is a word processing program, Word knows how to read a certain set of file types and translate whatever the ones and zeros are of that file into a document that we can edit and save and so forth. So it's very common that we might even know a couple of these file types by heart because we use them so often. So for example, if I'm writing a report on trees and I save it in a word processing document like Microsoft Corporation's Word, if I look at the file and the file name, I will see that it has a name component and then a dot. The dot is very important. So report dot and then there'll be a set of letters after that dot which is called the file extension. That file extension corresponds with the type of file. So docx 
refers to a way that Microsoft Word encodes or writes information about a document into the computer's hard drive. And so by viewing a file name with this extension, we can learn information about what type of program would be able to open this file. Now let's jump onto the computer and explore what we just discussed, which is files of names and types, and they're opened by certain uh, applications that are capable of reading the way those files are structured. I will uh, have our desktop open here. Microsoft Windows comes packaged with a program called the File Manager, which, you guessed it, helps us view, edit, move around, copy, delete files across the entire system. The easiest way to start it is by clicking on the system tray icon. If you hover over that, it says File Explorer. Wow, this is great. We can also do a search for the program called File Explorer. And when I open it, I see a default page that lists a bunch of files. Now files, of course, are not just a big long list inside the computer's hard drive, but rather they are organized into directories, and directories in Microsoft Windows are called folders. We will explore all about folders in exercise three, which is explained in the next video, video segment four. What we see show up here when I first pull up Microsoft uh, File Explorer is a list of recent files. So in this case, the program is um, using its own internal uh, record keeping to see what files has this user accessed recently. And so we'll see already that the characteristics of the files are uh, evident. I'm going to open the magnifier, magnifier, magnifier sitting right down here. Now when you pull up your own Windows Explorer, it's probably the case that when you look at a file, it does not have dot anything. It doesn't mean it's not there. Microsoft likes to shield you from the complete information about how the computer works. Don't ask me why, I think it's a rather political question, but the default settings of the Windows Explorer, the File Explorer, is to not show you those extensions. This is a new development in Microsoft Windows 7 and 10. Now you can ask the File Explorer to please show them to you by navigating to the View Ribbon, as they're called, and you can choose the way that the files are um, listed. And you can also say, please show me the file name extensions. It's probably the case that your file name extensions is unchecked. Go ahead and check that. And you should always have it checked. There's never a case in which I don't think you want to see the file extension. You actually run into quite a few problems because some programs automatically tack the file extension on and some don't. And if you can't see if it's there or not, you aren't able to troubleshoot that. So let's take a peek at what shows up under our recent files. I can see a couple of things that I've been working on. These are Microsoft Word files that are actually downloads of our course's week one student documents. With the details view enabled, so under view I can hit details, this gives us a vertical list of our files and we can see for any given file a couple of pieces of information. This is the file name. We see the dot and then the file extension. Great. We can see that File Explorer gives us the recent, the most recent date and time when this file was edited. The third column here contains the name of an application that is likely to be able to open this document. How does it know this? It knows this because the operating system keeps track of a bunch of different file extensions and 
which programs inside the computer are capable of opening and reading that file. And then finally, on the right-hand side, we see a listing of the size of the file. There are a number of units that we use to measure the size of a file, and I gave you a link in our exercise that actually asks you to uh, try converting those values to and from some common units. And so those are uh, listed, it's listed right here under this conversion tool. And this is fun because ultimately every file in the computer is some number of ones and zeros all laid out in a long line. So if we actually had a, a fancy microscope that could read electronic signals in the hard drive, all we would see is one long string of ones and zeros that the computer knows how to convert into files and then applications know how to read those files and display useful information. The file size is actually referring to the number of ones and zeros in the hard drive that describe this particular file. And so a kilobyte is a common way of measuring files, uh, say of Word documents and uh, pictures. We also have megabytes that you've heard of, so megabytes and kilobytes. You have flash drives are often measured in gigabytes along with memory. And these are factors, uh, so we could say that a thousand kilobytes make up a megabyte. So a thousand kilobytes make up a megabyte, a thousand megabytes make up a gigabyte, and, and so forth. And so I've given you that converter so that you have a chance to see that, say, this Word document created by Karen is 219 kilobytes. If I come over here to our converter, I can say, all right, data transmission and storage. So I can enter the number of kilobytes, so this was 219 kilobytes and say convert me and the computer will automatically show you the conversion of 219 kilobytes into all of the other major units of measurement. So this is the equivalent of converting meters to kilometers. We're measuring the same thing but the units are a bit different. It's helpful to have a sense for sizes so that when you're thinking about am I going to send this via email, am I going to store this on a flash disk, we can see what's a reasonable transmission mechanism. For example, a email program often does a limit of 30 or 20 megabytes for any given email. So by using File Explorer, we can check the size of the file and we can make decisions about if this is over 20 megabytes, I might store it to a cloud drive and send a link to that so that I'm not sending a big file in email. Now our converter said that 219 kilobytes actually corresponds with 1,794,048 bits that means that the single word process or Microsoft Word document is described by or is using 1,700,000 ones and zeros on the hard drive. And that's for a relatively small file. 219 kilobytes is very small. A common MP3 song that you might have is between 5 and 8 megabytes. So 5,000 to 8,000 kilobytes. So we're talking about a whole bunch of ones and zeros. This gives you a sense of scale of the files we're talking about. So let's do a little experiment. If I rename this file, that's one of the things that the operating system manages, I can do that by selecting the file and then right clicking it and I get what's called a context menu. These are all actions that I can take on this specific file. I can uh, view its properties, which uh, we will pull up now, and I can see that I get much more detailed information about this particular file than I receive in the list view. So I just pulled up Karen's Word document. We can see that the location of the file is described by 
a uh, file path, and we'll explore that in the final segment. Uh, the gist of this is that if I want to find out where the file is, I need to find the C drive, which usually refers to an entire hard drive, find the user's directory or folder, inside that the Eric D folder, and then the downloads folder. And inside that folder will be a file called week1 underscore Karen underscore 1364.docx. We get the size as Word sees it. It takes up a little bit more space on the hard drive disk because there's some information on there about where on the disk it lives. We can see creation, modification, and access. We can adjust the security of this file. So if I am worried about someone editing what's in the file, I can check it as read-only, which means that if you're not the current user, you will not be able to overwrite that file. These are handy things. And um, we can see that I can even change the default program that opens up .docx files. Now, Microsoft has created Microsoft Word, and it is the only program that defaults to opening any file with .doc or .docx as its extension. But if I close my properties window, and I come back to Karen's file, and I rename it, so I right click and jump up to rename, where is rename? Send to open, remove, edit. Hmm. So it's not allowing me to rename it in the recent files view. So I actually have to jump in. So we can see on the left hand side is a browser for where files on a computer are located. So I know because I just looked at these file properties that it's stored under downloads. So I can click the downloads directory and see all of the files that I have recently downloaded. So there's Karen's Word document. I'm going to zoom in again. I can right click Karen and now I should be able to rename this file. So I can rename it. And you'll notice that when the rename dialog comes up, it selects all of the text before the file extension, meaning in general, we don't want to tinker with that file extension because changing the name of report to say week one Karen 1364, we don't want to change the program that opens this file. We just want to change what it's called. But I want to demonstrate to you that this file extension is important. So I'm actually going to remove the file extension entirely. So I backspaced, I uh, backspaced out that, and then I hit enter. Now Windows is giving us a warning. If you change a file name extension, the file might become unusable. The reason it might become unusable is because a program will likely not know what to do with a file unless it knows its extension. And I'll say, yes, I'm doing a computer class, and I want to remove the extension. Now look how the listing of this file has changed in Windows Explorer. It used to say Microsoft Word document, just like the, sec the one underneath it does from Militia. It used to pull up a default icon for Microsoft Word, but now it has no information. It does not know that this file contains information that Microsoft Word knows how to turn into a document. So all it tells us is it's a file. It's a generic file. Now, don't fear. We can rename this again and restore the file extension because I haven't changed anything in the file itself. I just changed the name. I want you to see that file extensions help both the operating system and the user figure out what type of file it is and what can be done with it. That concludes our basic idea of the uh, files and how they work. The, next, the last thing I want to show you is that we might be familiar with certain types of file extensions like docx or mp3 or flv or mp4. These are all file extensions that correspond with commonly used functions on the computer. And there are a whole bunch of other types of files that we may never interact with, but I want you to see that there's more than just the standard user files. So to do that, we are going to navigate to directories on the computer that you may have never looked at before. 
And to do that, we're going to find the C drive on the left-hand menu bar. If I click C drive, I can see that within C, I have my user's directory. This is where most of my day-to-day -day files are stored. Now, program files, guess what? That's where programs maintain their configuration files and the data that they actually use to run the various features of the program. We're going to look in the Windows directory. The Windows directory is where the operating system keeps all of its files. Now I want you to get a sense for this. If we right click a directory or a folder, which means it's storing files inside of it, it's a container for files, I can come down and say properties of that entire directory. Now if I right click Windows and go to properties, look what it's doing. It is counting the number of files in this whole directory. It's going through every little directory or subdirectory and counting the number of files. I'm already up to 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50,000 files. 50,000 files to run this operating system. We are talking about massively complicated sets of files and applications that use those files. And we can see that in total, we're all, we'll see it's still counting. It takes a long time for the computer to sift through all those and see what they're doing. And it's still going, it's still going, it's still going. So almost 20 gigabytes of space on our hard drive, we're still 22 gigabytes of space, is used by the operating system to do all of these tasks, to manage security and get information to and from the RAM and the various pieces of hardware. 200,000 files. This is pretty incredible. Uh, and with that, we can now dig into a couple of these um, system related files. <sighs> So if I double click into Windows, I see a bunch of directories that probably don't mean very much to me, uh, but I can still poke through them. It's my computer and I want to see what's going on. Now notice that uh, most of these files will, if I click System32, this is a place where some of the most critical operating system files are located. These are not the kinds of files that we want to be tinkering with. We're not going to change the file extensions in here, but I want you to see what they are. So choose a directory. I might jump down to um, anything that looks somewhat interesting, uh, somewhat important. So I could say perhaps boot the boot folder, booting is the process of getting a computer turned on and the operating system loaded. You'll notice if I look at these files, I have a set of extensions that I probably have never seen before. So I have a winload.efi file. I don't know what EFI is, so if I right click properties and look at this, it's a relatively small file, 1.3 megabytes. It does not know which program knows how to open an EFI file. If I click change, it does not have a good guess. That's because this is a system level file and a user would never interact with this particular file by his or herself. Um, .exe, this is winload.exe. That's a very important file. That is a file that not, doesn't just store information. Winload exe is an executable file, which means the operating system can not just read that file and say put it in a text document, but it can run it. It can uh, tell the operating system this will pull up a window or this will carry out tasks in the computer. An exe file is Windows default executable extension. So when you see an exe, what that means is if you double click that file, if you run the file, it's not going to pull up another program. It's not going to pull up Microsoft Word and show you a report. It's going to do something. It's going to load a program. And uh, this particular file we're not going to run because it's used and it's run by the operating system itself. Um, so you can see these are system level files. I can jump back to C colon. If we go into program files, this is where things start looking a little bit more familiar. Each program that we run on the computer has its own directory. And I can 
uh, navigate into one of these directories like Synaptics, which is a, um, uh, a security program, I can see that I have WAV files. Uh, .wav is a sound file. So any file with WAV as an extension, say sound.wav, will be opened in a program that knows how to play sound. So if I double click button release, it will pop open this program called Groove Music and I haven't run this before so it is gro grooving, it's getting ready to play me a sound file and it will probably uh, well that wasn't very successful let's right click the file and let's actually see if I can open it with VLC Media Player which I do know uh, can play uh, sound files and this particular sound file doesn't do anything. Um, let's see, WMV, it probably doesn't know how to play WAV files. But in other words, you can see that I have um, various, I have a .exe, so that's an executable, and so forth. So that concludes our basic overview of files. The lesson exercise will give you instructions for how to proceed by looking for a couple of different types of files and documenting their size and uh, explaining their file types. So with that, enjoy exploring files and we will conclude. The last video for this week is making a file tree. So actually seeing how the many files on the computer are organized and uh, accessed by the system.